Hello and welcome to Tiny Desk Knitting with Emma. Today uh, I am wearing my Mayanus jacket, which is a jacket by Violet McQuaid for Jamesons of Shetland. I knit this in jumper weight, J Jameson and Smith two ply jumper weight. Jameson and Jamesons of Shetland versus Jameson and Smith is very confusing for a lot of people because the name Jameson is in both of them. <laughs> Um, but there's J and there's J and S and they're two different companies, but they basically make interchangeable yarn because it's all jumper weight Shetland wool. I mean, they both make other weights of yarn, um, like Aran and DK and whatever, but most people knit with two ply jumper weight, which is the Jameson and Smith version or, um, and their undyed version is jumper weight Supreme, or they knit with Jameson's of Shetland, or they knit with both and a mix of both. And there's tons and tons of colors, especially if you combine them combine them and all that stuff. So that's fun. So I knit mine in Jameson and Smith to ply jumper weight, except this gray here is jumper weight Supreme, which is just the same thing, but undyed and slightly thicker. Um, so yeah, today I am recording at a normal time. It's like 4 15 PM. Um, <laughs> I was going to record this morning, but I went to Frederick Fiberfest this morning. So I didn't want to, um, didn't want to record before I like went and got some stuff. So I got some roving as usual. And um, as, as usual now, I don't let myself buy yarn anymore because I have enough yarn and I'm like, just by roving, you now have the spinning wheels. I have two wheels now, one of them's not mine, but um, so yeah. And I have a dye tutorial for you today because people said that they wanted to see that. So I don't have like, you know, full setup for, for like, video tutorials. I literally just have my arm, the, I mean, obviously my arm, but I have a tripod arm thing. It's not a tripod cause it doesn't have three things, but it's a, it's like a flexible arm that I, um, that I just attach to the table. It holds your iPad too. If you want to like do hands-free or like lap free iPad or iPhone or anything. Um, so I have that. You can hear the, the wool on the stove. I'm dying more wool on the stove. Um, as always, dyeing lots of yarn and wool, but um, I've got a tutorial for you. So I um, recorded several videos and I'm gonna just string them together for you so that you can see them and um, it's pretty fun, <laughs> but you can't see anything in like super great detail. I just kind of like walk you through the process of like what you need and you'll see it's not very much you need basically a stock pot that you're not planning on using for actual cooking ever. Um, maybe you have an old one that you used to use for cooking, which is fine, as long as you don't then prepare food in it after you've had acid dyes in it. Um, you, so I just got mine at like Home Goods or TJ Maxx or something. It's not like a nice one. It's just like plain and it works great. Um, you need water and a water supply. You need uh, some kind of acid, so either citric acid, which is basically the sour stuff that you find on the outside of like Sour Patch Kids, um, which you can order online or find at like some stores, like some grocery stores probably have it. I just get it on Amazon. You can also use vinegar, but vinegar makes it stink a little bit because vinegar smells bad. I mean, it smells sour. Citric acid dissolved in water does not smell sour. It just it doesn't smell like anything. So I use that. Um, and what else do you need? I use a, a big wooden spoon that I, again, it says yarn only on it. So everyone, it's covered in dye. It's like different colors. So I think people know not to use that for cooking. Plus it's not usually in the kitchen with the cooking supplies. <laughs> it's like with the dye supplies. So you need that, you need some fiber or, or yarn. Um, and you need dye and you need a heat source. So that's pretty much it. So I'm gonna take you through everything from getting the wool wet um, at the beginning to putting the dye in the pot. You also need an N95 mask or KN95, which I use um, to avoid breathing in the particles of the dye because that's not good for your lungs. Um, it can make you sick or something, you know, long-term bad effects or something, the particles of the dye. So um, I go through, yep, getting the wool wet, putting the dye in the pot. Um, oh, and you need rubber gloves. Yeah, you don't want to get dye all over your hands. Um, so putting the dye in the pot, you put the dye on the stove. I usually cover it. Um, turn the stove on probably to low heat is best um, so that it doesn't heat up too fast and felt. Um, once it's kind of simmering, boiling, whatever, you hear it start to hiss, you put in the mordant. So I pour in the citric acid dissolved in the water. Then the wool or um, fiber or yarn soaks up all that dye. It's soaked up a lot of it at that point already, but it soaks up the rest of it. And you can always tell because the water will look clear and the like you can see the bottom of the pot and it'll be clear. 
Whereas like before that, it'll be like purple or blue or red or whatever color you're trying to dye your yarn. Um, and yeah, I link it. I will link in the show notes where I get my dye. It's I use Dharma dyes. You can also use Jacquard. Jacquard has brighter colors. One of my friends uses Jacquard dyes, and hers are like so much brighter than mine. So I'm considering getting some Jacquard dyes or just borrowing hers <laughs> because uh, yeah, they're great. So anyway, um, yeah, I guess that's um, yeah. Let's go into it. Okay. All right, here's the first of video this dyeing tutorial. Today I'm going to be dyeing fiber, not yarn, but the process is exactly the same, except you have to be a little bit more careful with fiber because generally it is not superwash treated like most dyeable yarn is. You could be dyeing yarn that is non-superwash, which I have done. Sometimes I accidentally felt it. <laughs> this is a lot easier to felt. <laughs> um, so here is the first step. So I've got a bunch of wool here probably somewhere between two and three ounces. I did not weigh it. And I have a stock pot, which I only use for yarn. I do not use this for food. That would be dangerous. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put water in this because we need to wet the wool. You don't need to. You could put it straight into the water with dye already in it, but pre-soaking it makes the color kinda go more evenly into the wool or the yarn or whatever you're using. So this yarn, so or the wool, the white one is Cheviot, gray is Corydale, and the brownish white one is here is mixed blue face luster BFL. So I'm gonna do this. We're really gonna try and get all of it wet. It doesn't need to soak for very long. Um, sorry, if you didn't hear that, um, the white is Cheviot, the gray there is Corydale, and then this Brownish white is mixed blue face luster. So this isn't really deep enough. I'm gonna need to add more water, but you get the idea. So we saturate the wool, not for super long. Um, and that is step one. <laughs> so stay tuned for step two, which for you will be right now, but for me will be in a few minutes. Okay, so right now it's gonna be a little hard to see. This is very important. I'm wearing this mask because when I open the dye, I wanna be wearing this mask because I do not wanna breathe in this dye. I have pretty bad lungs. This dye is not super safe um, to breathe in. So I wear the mask. Okay, so I'm gonna be using this color of Dharma Acid Dyes. It's called Deep Purple. And next thing is I need gloves. <laughs> I need gloves. Okay, what's in here? Okay, I need gloves. Sometimes I use this jar to dissolve the dye. I don't really need to do that in the big pot. I usually do that if I'm using like the, um, the burner there, which you can see, that's usually what I use. But right now I don't have any like aluminum things that go on it. So that's not what I'm gonna use. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of lift this out of the water a little bit. It doesn't really matter if it's still in there. And I have this guy, which is just a teaspoon and I don't use this for food just for dye. So open this up again. Keep your mask on while this is open. I'm going to just grab a little bit. I don't need a lot. You can weigh this if you want. You can make stock and stuff, but I don't usually do that. And I'm going to like just put it into the water and dissolve it. Like stir it around a little bit. And that's not a lot of color, I realize, because when you put the yarn back in, you can kind of see that it's not super saturated. So I'm gonna need some more. I'm gonna let this out again. This is where you wear, why you wear gloves. There we go. Okay, that's better. This is gonna go into my old Chobani thing so that it doesn't like touch the counter and stuff after it's touched dry. Okay, these are gonna go away. Take this guy off. Okay. Cool, that was step two. Now I'm gonna flip this thing around and we're gonna go to the stove for step three. Okay, so this is my pot on the stove. Lights on so I can see that. I'm actually gonna cover this because it's gonna come to a simmer point a lot faster if I cover it. So I'm gonna turn on the stove and I'm gonna turn it to medium low. I want it to heat up, but not too, too fast. 
I'm gonna put the lid on because it'll heat up a little faster if I do that. And now I'm gonna wait until I start to hear it simmer and um, then you can join me again for adding the mordant, which is super fun. Oh, someone's taking their recycling bin back. Someone stole our recycling bin, so hopefully it's out there and we can take it back today. It's drama. Um, okay, so yeah, see you in a minute. Okay, so as you can see, this is very excited. <laughs> it's kind of hard to see. So we're just gonna, it's dark purple. And I'll just back up a little bit. That's a little bit better. I don't want to agitate this too much because then it all kind of fell. But this is citric acid. This is in an old orange juice bottle and I did pour boiling water into it and it kind of melted. So for reference, let's, let's, let's go learn what citric acid is. So I have some here. Citric acid is the stuff, it's like crystals. It's the stuff you find on the outside of Sour Patch Kids, which is why it has a lemon on it. It is very, um, it's a flavor enhancer. It's very, very, very sour. You can also use vinegar for this, but that kind of stinks. Citric acid doesn't smell like anything. So I just like dissolve several teaspoons of this in about a gallon of water and you can do it by weight. And then I just pour some of it into here. This is called a mordant. So the citric acid is going to help the dye or the yarn soak up the or the wool, soak up the dye. So right now this the water is purple, which you can probably tell. But in a minute, probably not long enough for short enough time for us to watch it happen, especially because there's a lot of steam coming off of this pot. The water is going to actually, oh yeah, I can see it. The water's clear. You can see it already. It's kind of like magic. Yep. So that's what the citric acid does. It soaks up or it helps the wool soak up all that dye. And now the water is clear and all of the dye is on the wool. So yep. Completely clear water, completely purple yarn, <laughs> very deep purple. The color is literally just called deep purple. So now I am going to take this off the heat. So I'm going to turn off the heat source. Some people like keep cooking it a little longer with yarn. I technically, or technically I tend to keep it on the stove a little longer after I add the citric acid, just because it takes a little longer for it to soak up the dye. Usually I probably also put a ton of citric acid into this. Like I wasn't measuring. I used to measure it and do like a 5% stock or something, but I didn't measure the wool, so I didn't measure the citric acid either. So that's all for now. I'll, uh, I'm going to take this outside to cool. So this has to cool all the way down to at least room temperature or colder. Um, and it's nice and chilly outside, so it's probably going to cool in a couple of hours. And I will meet you back here once it's all cooled off and show you how to clean it. Hi, I'm back. It's the next day. Obviously, I'm wearing a completely different outfit and my hair's wet. <laughs> so, um... This beautiful purple wool has um, chilled overnight, and I'm gonna wash it now and hang it to dry. So I've got my pail, and I'm gonna basically lift this out. Ooh, that's not in color. I'm gonna squeeze a little bit so you can see what the color is. It's very nice purple, deep purple. Yeah. The dye is called deep purple, so not surprising. There's the Cheviot. I think that's the that's the gray base, so that's gotta be the Corydale. Okay, so I'm gonna dump this out. I wanna try and use the water as close to the same temperature as possible as um, this has cooled down to. So I'm gonna use just cold water from the sink because it's cold out today. So I'm gonna turn the sink on. And I'm going to use some wool wash. I use this just because it smel kind of smells good. If this is a jasmine uniform wool wash. Um, makes my fiber smell good when I'm spinning it. You can use the natural one. You don't have to use soap. I tend to use soap just, again, it's, it smells nice and just kind of rinses the hot wool, citric acid-y, mordant smell out. It's not a bad smell. If, if you use vinegar, it's more important to use soap, especially like a scented soap will cover up the smell of that vinegar. But um, using citric acid doesn't make it stink. But you know, I like to I like to make it smell nice. So you don't need to rinse you going. Sometimes this water will still have a little dye in it. You could be wearing I could be wearing gloves for this. I'm not wearing gloves for this. Um, 
the water is coming out very faintly purple, so I'm just gonna like rinse it a little bit more. <laughs> so that because you don't want the color to bleed on your hands after you while you're spinning, which probably wouldn't happen, or when you wash like any kind of finished skein or finished garment or object or accessory that you need or crochet with it. So yeah, I think I'll get there. Dump that out. I don't want to squeeze it too much because it'll compact. It's okay if it gets compacted. As long as it's not felted, you can kind of pre-draft it, pull it apart a little bit. If you're using yarn, not, you know, raw wool or processed wool. This isn't raw wool. I, this has been processed and combed and everything. It's it's top or roving. Um, some of it's roving and some of it's top. <laughs> uh, and uh, But with yarn, yeah, with yarn, you do need to make sure it doesn't get super tangled. It has those ties on it to make sure it doesn't get tangled, but sometimes it can still get a little tangly in the water. Uh, rarely do I have that issue, but I have had that issue where I've had to like basically hand wind a skein and unwind the entire thing and it takes forever. So not really recommended. Okay, so that's all. Um, I will show you the dry finished wool when I record my like regular episode tomorrow. I'll show you it there. So I'm gonna go hang it outside to dry. You can just put it, you know, in your, somewhere where you don't mind if water drips on the floor. So like I do that in the basement if I need to do it inside, or if it's sunny out, I just put it outside. Um, we're getting to the time of the year when I won't be able to do that because it'll be too cold and we are insulating our back door, so we'll pr probably use, be using it at all. But that's uh, that's the washing process. This is just like a quick rinse with some eucalyptus. Try not to use a different temperature water um, than you have cooled it down to. And yeah, see ya. Okay, so that was fun and exciting. And you couldn't see much when there was like steam in the pot, as you can tell, but you know, I wanted to just sort of take you through the different steps. And this is what it looks like now. It is very deep, beautiful, deep purple. This is the Cheviot. So I was dyeing Cheviot, which was white, and then the gray Corydale, and then I think I had a mixed BFL. Yeah, I was dyeing the, the mixed BFL, which is the white and brown BFL. So Cheviot's very like, it's sort of downy. It's part of the sort of close to the down family. So it's very um, squishy and it gets big and when it's dry and it's all like fun. This is not felted as you can see, I'm drafting it out to show that it's not felted. Um, it doesn't felt very easily. It's Chivia in particular doesn't felt very easily. So that's good. I also have the Cory and the, and the um, BFL, but they're not as dry cause they're like a longer, like um, more compacted wool, so they take longer to dry than this very downy Corydale. So very, Corydale, Cheviot, this is Cheviot. So that's fun. So there's that, which is great. Okay, so um, let me talk about what I got at Fiberfest. Didn't get nearly as much as I got <laughs> sheep and wool last weekend, but I got some fun stuff. So I got a couple of bags from Windswept Willows Farm. This is called Farmhouse Wool Blend Roving in the colorway Cornflower. It was four ounces. Yeah, there you go. This is a, I just loved this color. I thought it was really nice. I was like, wow, I might actually make like one skein of yarn using just this color because it's so pretty and I love it. So we'll see, maybe. There's definitely variegation in here, so it could still be like really pretty. Um, and then I got this one, which is also Roving Ends. So this is just four different colors. So there's white, gray, the pink, and then the green. I'm thinking of just spinning this all together in like one skein and just have it like be like kind of crazy. That'd be fun. I don't know. We'll see. I, I like to just grab colors and like have them um, out. So um, another thing that somebody asked me uh, on in an email maybe or was it in a comment was how I um how I like split the yarns up to barber pull them and like the kind of process of that. So I'm gonna talk about that today too. Um, again, like I'm very new to this. I'm just gonna tell you what I do and that seems to be fine. Um, I've learned some things, which I'll also explain, but I got a couple of other things. I got four ounces of Rambouillet. That's this beautiful kind of like light brown. So I'm probably gonna dye this just cause it's fun. And it's beautiful and it's so soft. Rambouillet is really soft. It's when I started spinning a couple <laughs> a couple weeks ago, um, three weeks ago, I guess, it was um, harder for me to spin Rambouillet the first time I spun that because 
it just kind of like got came out of my hands really fast because it was soft. Um, but now that I kind of have a handle on that a little bit more, I find Rimbolet very nice and not hard to draft. Um, I got, this is four ounces anymore because they took some of it off, but this is dark brown Shetland, like a natural Shetland. And then I got white as well. And this is a little bit um, greasy. And I got one that she had a variety of the white ones. And I just got um, the one that had like kind of the most lanolin and seemed to be the most like kind of real wool. I don't know. I feel strongly that my wool should feel like wool. And so I was like, I'll take the least processed one. <laughs> so I'll probably be dying that. Um, I don't know if I'll die the natural Shetland. The woman who sold it to me said, you know, you should try dyeing this dark brown, like with like jewel tones, like really over dyed. And I was like, that sounds really nice. So I might try that and see what happens too. It'd be kind of fun. Okay. So let's talk about my shifty first. So you saw my shifty last week because I'd started it. Here are the two balls of yarn now. This one is, this, this is the second ball of yarn that I had taken out of the inclinations. And then this is my white. I'm about to split for the sleeves. So I have this much now. I am really enjoying um, the both the knitting and also just like the really fun color shifts and just like the knowing that I did this, I made this yarn. It's crazy to think that. Um, and I think this is gonna relax a lot when it's blocked, but I really like the kind of pebbly texture. I like the color shifts. There's some green there. There's a navy that kind of got into the, there. It's sort of more tealy gray up here. I just like really like this. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it's about deep enough to split the sleeves. This is the back and this is the front of the neck. Yeah, it's like something like that. Um, yeah, I'm very pleased with this so far. I think it's gonna be a little crazy. So I definitely didn't make enough of this for a whole sweater. Um, this may last me like the rest of the body. I don't, I doubt it. <laughs> that would be, uh, yeah, I don't think that that will happen. So to combat, this is the next skein that I'm going to use, which I spun with the same basic colors, but there's more kind of green on green, a little bit of sapphire in there, a little less purple. We're just kind of fading into the more green here. And then I've got an even lighter one, which is like, this was all, this, these were two of the same bobbin. This two, same two bobbins, there was just like, it was lighter on one end. So this is the lighter end with the, like a lighter purple. Still lots of green in there. It's, it's, there's some nice purple moments where the purple's applied with purple or even the lightest purple's applied with purple. Yeah, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to work these in as well. And just in case, um, just in case, I need another one. I started spinning another one. I was like, I might not need it. Or I might like that one better and end up using that one instead of this, like, especially the lighter one, which is really different, like as an interim skein between that one or this, or maybe that'll be the third one. I don't know. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about my barber pulling process. So I'm not going to show you what it looks like because I just have one bobbin going now. I don't know how much it weighs. It's on the match list, which is, it's hard to take the bobbins off. So it's a whole process. You have to basically like take, you know, if you have a matchless, you know, you like unscrew it and it comes off and then the strings fall off and there's like a whorl and a bobbin and a flyer that's just like everywhere and you're trying to get another bobbin off the Lazy Kate and it's like, yeah, it's a whole process to take the bobbins off. So I tend not to do that until I'm done with a, with a bobbin or I need, really need to weigh two bobbins to compare them or something. So, okay. So here are the things that I have that are going to go into this yarn. We're already going into this yarn because the first bobbin's already done. So I've got this kind of, this is the midnight, midnight blue that I did last week. This is Cheviot, I think. This is the gray Cheviot, yeah. Got the gray Cheviot. This is a purple Corydale. No, this is, this is gray Corydale, sorry. This is also a Corydale, but this was dyed. I bought this from um, the Woolery. This is also the purple Corydale. It's, or yeah, it's a lot of Corydale going into this. This is, this is the kind of like a, a green, um, show me all together at some point. And then this is the super puffy Chivia, as you can probably tell. So, and then this is a Coopworth that I got at Rhinebeck. So I think these are all the colors. There's two of each. There's two purples, two blues, 
No, two blues. This is a blue, sort of a steel blue. And then there's the two greens. So all together, kind of just like a little bit of a, a fun mess. Yeah, lots going on in there that I'm gonna end up spinning all together, which should be good time. I'm excited about that, yeah. So there's all those. So yeah, we'll see what happens with that shifty. Um, I'm looking forward to, you know, seeing how much of um, other colors, you know, I might need and that kind of thing. Just looking outside, I dyed a kind of peachy, it's called the colorway of the dye is called peach blush. And it's really pretty. And it's like a, it's just a blushy peach color. It's really, it's really pretty. I did my first mix this week. I mixed, um, was it this one? I think it was this one. I mixed midnight blue and I mixed sunflower yellow. That was fun. And I came out with this. So I was pleased with that. I always think my greens are too teal. Like the greens that I have for some reason, even the forest green comes out kind of teal. So I don't know. I try to, yeah. Okay. So let's talk about some of the skeins that I made this week. Sorry, this is so much spinning content. I did knit this. So out of hand spun, but I did knit it and I'm very pleased with it. And I hope this is the YouTube screenshot because if it's not, I'm going to have to go watch it and screenshot this moment where you're, you can see my shifty and then everyone will want to watch it because they'll see this pretty thing. Yeah, my video last week got like a ton of views, like way more views than I usually get. And I'm not sure if it's because it said Rhinebeck or if it was because I had a very beautiful fair isle cowl in the front, which is still drying. I blocked it sitting right here. It's still drying. The outside is dry, but the inside's still wet because it hasn't seen the sun or anything. So I'm just going to bring it to Monica's and hopefully she will just stick it on something. It just needs to like sit on something like upright so that air can flow into here. Sorry, I just was smelling it because I was smelling it. That's why. I don't know why. But yeah, in case you missed it, I did this. It's what I showed last week and this is my hand spun. And as you can probably tell, it's quite thick and thin, but I love it. I am a huge fan of this. It's just the colors are like totally glowing and it's very vibrant and I love it. So there's that, but that was from last week. Okay, now I'll show you some of my hand spun. Okay, so I'll tell you my plans for knitting it because I am gonna do that. Okay, so this is a huge skein. This is like 200 and some yards of like, I don't know, it's probably like DK-ish sport. This is a whole bunch of stuff. And I think I showed you guys the bobbins of this last week. It's just, or on Tuesday, I guess. So but you're watching us on Tuesday, so you did it last week. So there's a little bit of pink in here, lots of different blues, some teal, some kind of like whitish, some emerald green. These were basically, a lot of this was just odds and ends. I got at Rhinebeck. Um, a lot of it was stuff that I dyed too, but the, there's some neon green. Yeah, so there's a more neon green. Yeah, I just really spun a bunch of stuff all in the kind of color families that I wanted to have in this shifty. So this is gonna be for my shifty by Andrea Mowry, and my main color is gonna be the um, De Rerum Natura Ulysse in Belen Blue, which I showed some episodes ago having had cast, I'd like had cast on this like gray ghost by Thea Coleman and then I remembered that I wanted to knit the sparky with it and I was like okay Emma just tear this out you're hardly done any anyway and spin something for sparky and I did and here it is so I don't know if this is enough for the whole sweater so yesterday I was just two days ago I don't know I was plying singles together it's not here no I have some other hands spun on the chair to show you but um I did like another kind of just like random singles that are sort of mostly in this color family because I had just had some like bobbins where they'd run out at different times and I just kind of went for it. So um, I have another skein that's not this big obviously, but it's like more in case I want more and it's brighter, there's more neon in it. So I might start with that one so that's like at the top. Um, I don't know, maybe I'll start with this one. It's gonna be great. I'm very excited. And if again, if I run out, I just have more roving. I can just make more skeins of like random hand spun. So I definitely need to get better at like consistency. I mean, everybody needs to get better at consistency when they start spinning, but consistency so that it's 
frequently one way. I do have a Nitty Naughty like from Rhinebeck that does act actually know like it's a yardage counter because it's two yard Nitty Naughty. So I know how much yardage basically I have um, on these skeins, which is helpful to a point. So that's great. But um, because it's not super even, you know, I haven't done a gauge swatch yet. I don't know. It's definitely going to be thicker than the original, which is dyed in the wool. Um, and the, you know, the main color, Dere Mentor, that's a sport, but um, it's springy. It's it's a pretty, like, you know, if you pull too hard on that, it's going to break. So you don't want to knit that at a tight gauge because it's, it's a combo wool and worsted spun, I think. But it's very, it's soft. It's merino. It's not, you know, it's not super strong. So you got to be careful with that and knit it at a loose enough gauge. And this is also going to be a little bigger than the regular gauge. So we'll see what happens. I don't know if I'm going to have that cast on next week. I really got to, every time I record, I'm like, I need to take out that reindeer sweater and re-knit it for Ian because Christmas is getting closer. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe I should have it done by Thanksgiving because I forgot to get Ian a birthday present this year and his birthday was like in March and I could be like, here's your super belated birthday present so he can like wear it during December to like ugly Christmas sweater parties and stuff because that would be kind of funny. He might like that. I don't know. We'll see. That would be at least kick my butt because I am seeing him for Thanksgiving. <laughs> We're all going to Toronto, me and my mom and my brother. My dad's going to Albuquerque. My dad doesn't, we don't really celebrate Thanksgiving at my house ever because my mom's family is Canadian and my dad just likes to do productive things during Thanksgiving, which I really respect. Last year, he and I moved to Baltimore. Well, I moved to Baltimore and he came with me. Um, so he came with me here. We made pierogies for Thanksgiving and we watched football at Nitten's apartment and we had a really good time. Um, but yeah, usually we used to go to Toronto, which is where I went to college. And before I was in college, we would go there and visit my mom's sister who still lives there. So we're all going, me and my mom and Ian are going, um, for that part of that week. I'm going for most of the week. And then, um, yeah, Ian can visit his friends in Kingston, which is where he did his first year, two years, year and a half of undergrad. Kingston's in Ontario. He went to Queens for a year and a half before COVID. And then, um, yeah, so I'm going to see him. And I'm going to see all my college friends. Thank God. Because they don't have the week off because it's Canadian. Thanksgiving's like in October. So I get to see all of them because they all have to work. <laughs> so sad for them, but good for me. But anyway, we always have gone to Toronto then because, you know, it's not quite as crazy to fly to Canada. It's not quite as expensive. And it's just like, it's not crazy. Like you can go shopping and it's not as crazy there. I've been in the U.S. a few times for Thanksgiving and I'm like, this is insane. I haven't been to Canada for U.S. Thanksgiving since before I started graduate school. But all my friends, every year they ask. I was supposed to go one year and then my mom's other sister got really sick in California. She's fine now. But we all went there that year. But anyway, I'm going to see him. So maybe I'll knit the sweater. So yeah, I love Toronto. I just miss it. I was there for Canadian Thanksgiving last year. But it was like a really short trip. It was like two days plus the driving was another two days. <laughs> um, and me and my mom stay with her friend Barb, her childhood friend Barb, who's super cool and lives, she lives really close to where I used to live um, downtown near campus. So she lives in near Chinatown, which is where I lived. She lives in a super cool neighborhood. And I like to stay down there because it's like where I lived and it's my old neighborhood. And like, you know, I can go to all my favorite coffee shop and go get the shop and vintage shopping with my mom and stuff. And just, we have a really good time. So I'm super stoked um, to do that. And yeah, I can't wait. So that's fun. Um, yeah, so my hand's fun. The rest of my hand's fun. Okay, here's a couple skeins. So the three, I guess. So this one, you can see them all, so it's not much of a surprise. This one, I guess I should snap it. If you don't know what that is, this is when you are setting the twist. You can also just whack it on something. It's called thwacking. But I like to set it. Um, this, you know, it just kind of helps the yarn settle. Um, so if you're gonna knit with it, I would say if you're gonna knit with your hand spun, you should thwack or snap your yarn. Um, just because this um, sets the twist better and it like gives you a more accurate gauge. Like, you know, if you knit with this and it wasn't finished. Um, it depends on the yarn and the, you know, the fiber content and stuff and how you prepared it and spun it and all that. But there's definitely like a risk that the yarn will puff up a lot more than you're expecting. 
um, unless you do a gauge swatch and you find that out. It's best to do something like this, like a wet finish where you wash it so this is still a little damp and then you snap it to set the twist properly and just kind of settle it a little bit so that it acts more like it's gonna act when it's part of the fabric that's been washed and stuff. So in case you're wondering why people do that, that's why. So you can't tell the difference at all or after you're doing this, but this is, anyway, this is the BFL that I got at Rhinebeck from um, Feederbrook Farm, which I linked in last week's show notes. I'll link it again, because you can buy packages of fiber from them. This was not expensive and they don't sell it for more. Like it wasn't like a special, um, you know, Rhinebeck sale. This is, it was like 20 bucks for like four or eight ounces of this BFL. It is like pencil rubbing. It's super, super thin. So I actually had to spin this on my, um, my single drive wheel, Monica's wheel that her dad made, um, the bobbin lead wheel, because it was just way too, um, it was just flying out of my hands. I should have just turned down the tension or I could have done something on the shaft, but it was like still a little new to me and I didn't really know what I was doing. And so I just was like, let me just spin this on the other wheel cause I've got it and it's fine. Um, plying it was um, not a fun because I got with the matchless, I got a tension lazy Kate, which, oh my gosh, plying is so much easier on an actual lazy Kate than this. It's tensioned and it sits on the floor and they rotate like that and they're not like stuck to the bottom of the wheel. I haven't shown you these wheels, but this one has, it's really just bobbin storage, but it acts as a lazy cape when I'm using it. This wheel, the bobbin lid wheel that Monica's dad made, which is amazing. Um, and I should have just made a lazy cape using my laundry basket and some dowels, but I just like never got around to that. So yeah, it was a little breaky when I was plying it. And I definitely got some pigtails in this. Like if you're a spinner, you know what I'm talking about, but um like this, this guy here, that's a pigtail, where one is like a little over plied and you don't catch it before it, you ply the yarns together while you're plying anyway. You can catch those sometimes, but um, it's just like a little bit of an over plied spot in the singles. So I talk as though I know exactly what I'm saying. I have been spinning for three weeks today, so I don't know what I'm talking about. If you know what you're talking about and I don't, please just be like, why are you doing this? Or just know that I, I know that I don't know what I'm talking about and I'm kind of talking, you know, as though I do and I know that. So this I applied on a tighter whorl. This was my my sample spin on the tighter whorl. So this is all pinks, burgundies, white, a couple little bit of brown, some dark purple. I just thought this would be really fun and it is fun. It is really fun. I think I'm gonna make like a hat or something with like like a Stephen West pattern hat, like the cable hat that like has two colors and has slip stitches. And so I'll like to have a like white like this and like the this yarn has like the color changing. Yeah, something fun like that. Or like Andrew Mowry flicker and flame hat or something. Maybe both, I could make both. I'm seeing a lot of people in Toronto, so I feel like I need to, I don't need to knit for them, but I kind of want to. Like, you know, it's nice to, especially for like my aunt who is amazing and I'm gonna stay with her and stuff for a couple days and yeah. I've knit her a lot of sweaters. She is very noteworthy. And then this one, I'm really proud of this one. These were also just dyed rubbing I got from Rhinebeck. There's red, a red one and a yellow one. They were like, I don't know, I got like two ounces of each and I applied the red and then the yellow and then I on the other one I applied the red and then the yellow and I ended up putting some green on this, but I didn't like the neon green, so I used that to make another skein, which is outside. Oh yeah, that one is a little crazy, the green and orange, but it doesn't matter. This is the orange and yellow, and it is gorgeous. I'm obsessed with this skein. Yeah, I'm really into this. So, big fan. All right, you can really see it up close. This this was a good spin. I, did a, I feel like I did a good job. This was the first I think this is the first ply I did on the matchless. I don't know, maybe it was like the second ply I did on the matchless, but I was really pleased with this ply. There were no pigtails. I mean, there were probably a couple, but like a, a lot fewer pigtails. I'm still not 100% consistent in my thickness, but I'm getting better with the matchless. My consistency is pretty good on the single drive wheel, but I just like, I don't really wanna use that one because the it's really hard to ply. Um, so yeah. It's looking pretty good. And that sounds like I need to, um, I need to go add some acid to that yarn pot. So, you know, I think this has been, <laughs> this 
sufficiently long. This hasn't been a super long video probably because I don't think the dye tutorial takes up very much time. Maybe I'm wrong and it's like a good 15 minutes. But anyway, it's got hand spun. We've got new roving so that I can have more new hand spun. We've got knitting with hand spun. I'm just so excited about this. If you have ideas or you want to say what you knit with your barber pull yarn or your hand spun, um, please let me know. I would love pattern suggestions. I would love this to be a place where we can share patterns. Again, if you would like to get barber pull yarn and you don't spin, variety of places that I've linked in the show notes, you can get it from Spin Cycle, which is quite famous and quite expensive. Spin Cycle, um, you can get it from Yarn Hero, which is in Frederick, Maryland. I just saw them at the Frederick Fiber Fest today, but I didn't get any because I'm making my own now. Um, Frederick, uh, yeah, Yarn Hero, you can get Feederbrook Farm, which is also in my area, and that's where I got this roving for this. Lovely, I got it at Rhinebeck, which, you know, both of us had to travel a long way to get to, but me and also Feederbrook. But that's where I got this, um, so that's exciting. And then, um, what's the other one? Junction. You can get that at the Woolly Thistle. So all those are linked in the show notes. Junction is so nice. And I've written like which weights you can get. Like Spin Cycle only has, well, Spin Cycle has a variety of different yarns, but the color changing ones are like Dream State and Dyed in the Wool. So you can get, basically get it in sport fingering weight and then like a worsted DK. Um, Feederbrook has like definitely de Entropy DK, I think is the weight. Um, yarn Hero has every weight. They have worsted DK, sport, sock, fingering, whatever. Um, and then they might even have a bulky. Junction, I think that's like DK Light Worsted, the one that making tracks the Woolly Thistle carries. So if you want some Barbara Pull yarn, you can get it from them. And I would love it if people would share those and then I can share them next time um, and maybe try some of those patterns. Yeah, I would like to have like maybe a hat or two done next week. We'll see. I'm trying to knit. I got to get through some socks still. I really do. I've like really fallen off the sock train and I... Just need to finish that one pair for October and then cast on my November pair and then we're gonna be good to go. But yeah, we gotta, I gotta get cracking on that. So anyway, I'm gonna go and do more of this Barber Pulley fun spin. Maybe try and get that second bobbin started. I gotta weigh that first bobbin, see how much I have. And then, um, yeah. So you can like and subscribe and you leave a comment if you would like to do that you can email me with any questions barnabynits at gmail.com all those things are in the show notes um and uh yeah you can ring the bell if you want to get notified um yeah so this has been great i have really enjoyed this has been a shorter video for me right now because i put a big dye tutorial in the middle that i didn't just record right now <laughs> so that's kind of nice so i'm gonna go put this hand spin back outside so it can dry i'm so Oh my gosh. Um, I hope that this inspires anyone to like try spinning, even if it's just like a drop spindle. Um, try your friend's wheel. Don't forget, it takes a lot of practice. Um, so if you can have time to like have a wheel and sit with it for a few weeks, that's gonna help. This is what I've done in three weeks. So, and also like this. So it's possible to, you know, just get, you know, do you know, you can do it. It's, it's in you, especially if you're a fiber person. And I just learned from YouTube and I got a couple of books that I will, I'm going to, I got Yarn and Texture by Jillian Moreno and I got, um, oh, the other one, The Intentional Spinner by Judith McKenzie. So I'm going to do some, I started reading Yarn and Texture, but I'm going to like kind of have a sit down with those books this week and then maybe talk about them next week. And yeah. Let you know how I like them. If you have any other books you love about spinning, let me know what they are because I would love to get them, get my hands on them and read them. And yeah, thanks for watching. This has been Tiny Desk Knitting with Emma. Bye.